Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates, and here at No Limits, we want to help strengthen you, encourage you, and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin, and I want to thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. We are in a series where we are exploring the seven I am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. God blessed us last week where Jesus talked about being the bread of life. Mm. Today I want to explore the eighth chapter, the twelfth verse of the Gospel of John right there. In John chapter 8, verse 12, there's this second saying in this series of reflections by the Lord. The word of the Lord says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never, somebody say never, will never walk in darkness, but he will have the light of life. Amen. I am the light of the world. I want to try to preach today, church, from the thought, I'm still lit. Amen. Slap high five with your neighbor. Say, neighbor, after everything I've been through, I'm still lit. Come on, put your hands together. I'm still lit. You know, in the early days of the Olympic Games in Greece, there was a particular kind of race called the Lampadedromia. It was a race. It was a very popular kind of race. The word Lampadedromia simply means a torch race. And the runner who won the race was not just the man who crossed the line in the shortest amount of time. The man who won the race was the one who crossed the finish line in the least amount of time but still had his torch still burning. With inclement weather, rugged terrain, and quite frankly, fatigue setting in, runners had to figure out how to balance making progress on the one hand and ensuring that the process didn't take them out on the other. They had to figure out how to move forward without allowing the conditions and the wind to blow out the light that was in their lamp. And so the winner was declared to be the person whose light was still lit. Are y'all with me today? I thought about that image and, and it seemed to me that that is precisely the image that reflects the challenge of life. Figuring out how to keep the torch of our lives lit while we are trying to run the race that God has for us. There are so many people who start this race filled with hope and optimism and determination, but then somewhere along the way, the flame that lights their lives go out, extinguished by hardship, trauma, and racism, extinguished by trying to survive in a world of diminishing finances, trying to keep the torch of their lives lit, but it gets snuffed out of them by violence and abuse and depression and addiction and the lack of proper support. Am I alone here today? Is there anyone who knows what it's like to try to run this race and keep your light lit? In many ways, the world in which we live has a way of blowing out our light right now. We are once again in the throes of having to come to terms with the criminal seditious actions of the worst president in U.S. history. All the while, white evangelicals remain silent at the same time, and in some instances, they, dis they endorse the most insane form of political theology that is again what we saw during the time of slavery. It is enough to blow out your light. Our sense of civility is being sapped out of us by bigots who no longer have any shame. At one time, ours was a nation that was an example of freedom and hope and democracy for the world to emulate. But now, 
We are seriously flirting with fascism and tyranny, unleashing the worst demons of the American character upon the land. We, we witness social unrest, political turmoil, and domestic terrorists as are constantly threats to our daily lives. In the midst of it all, we've got to figure out how to keep our lights lit. In the midst of it all, our lights are flickering and flirting with being blown out. To quote Thomas Paine, these are times that try men's souls. Our ethical compass has been broken. Our moral barometer is being compromised each and every day. And yet, we come to this sacred space called church to see if there is light for a dark world. We, we gather to praise God. We gather to give thanksgiving to God. But at the end of the day, we want to know if there is something or someone who, despite the darkness that surrounds us, is able to pick us up and turn us around and place our feet on solid ground. We, we, can find, we want to find courage in recognition that this is not the first time, church, that darkness has been prevalent and pervasive upon the earth. No, this is not the first time, and we are not the first generation of believers who've had to figure out how to make it in the dark world. In fact, Scripture begins, and it reminds us that in the beginning, the earth was without form, and and full of darkness until God spoke and said, let there be, oh, I feel like preaching. The initial creative act of God occurs when God brought order out of disorder by the mere power of his word. And in an instant, just like that, there was light. Which suggests to me that the darkness we are seeing uh, should not cause us to feel resigned to futility. No, it should not cause us to throw up our hands uh, and surrender for when things are at their darkest. The Bible suggests that God is just getting started. That when things are at their worst, God is just beginning uh, to step up to the microphone of life. And sing his song uh, that when things are at their darkest, God is just beginning uh, to turn things around. Genesis reminds us that there is something on the other side of darkness. And what is on the other side is going to be better and brighter and bigger than whatever exists. Somebody ought to shout right there. And the mere fact that with everything you have gone through, the mere fact that you are still alive in the face of all of the hell that you have had. Just think about everything that you have had to endure in these last two years. The mere fact that you are still here after all of that is a testament and a testimony that you are still lit. You've been running your race with your torch in your hand with layoffs and letdowns and disappointments and abuse and bankruptcy and health issues, problems in your body, death in your family. And the torch that lights up your life and lights up your soul is still lit. Come on, turn to your neighbor, say, neighbor, I'm still lit. That was the wrong neighbor. Tell your other neighbor, I'm still lit. This idea, this idea of remaining lit in the face of the threat of darkness is how we should hear the words of Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 12, that he is the light of the world. Jesus is saying that with all of the darkness around us that conspires to dim and to diminish what God is doing within us, the good news is, is that there is still some fire on the torch of our life, with everything that seeks to quench what God is doing, with everything that keeps us from possessing and accomplishing what God has done on our behalf, we are still here, we're still lit. And whether we know it or not, whether we know how we made it, the good news is that we made it. Whether we know how we got through it, the good news is we got through it. Uh, we do not have to fear in the face of what seeks to oppress us 
and to blow out the light of our lives because we are still here. Somebody ought to shout. Someone else ought to thank God. Someone ought to throw up your hands and holler that I am still lit. <laughs> had to deal with radiation. Had to deal with chemotherapy. But I'm still lit. <laughs> had to deal with layoff and bankruptcy and foreclosure. But I'm still lit. Had to see the doctor dealing with depression and anxiety and borderline schizophrenia. But I thank God oh, I'm still Come on, somebody ought to push your neighbor and say, I'm still lit. And because I realize I'm still lit, I'm going to give God thanks. I'm going to give God praise. And if the last thing I do, I'm going to give God the honor. I'm the light of the world. I should have been dead and gone. I should have been buried in my grave. But I'm still here. In saying I am the light of the world, Jesus is saying something about himself. But he is also modeling for us something about our posture and our stance in relation to a dark world. He is saying that in Jesus Christ, he is able to convert the darkness of our worst days into better days. That God is able to transform what comes to harm us into something that can help us. And that we ourselves might be able to convert what is designed to destroy us into something that can develop us. And that's how you know that you are still lit. When you can look at the weapons that were formed to take you out. When you can look at the list of the people that the devil dispatched to destroy your life and realize that through it all, I'm still here. That's when you know I'm still lit. It speaks to the reality that darkness does not signal the end of our story. It lets us know that there is no darkness that is formed against us that has to prosper. That wherever there is darkness in the world or in our lives, it has not come to stay. It came to pass. I'm talking to someone who's dealing with darkness right now. It has not come to stay, but it has come to pass. And Jesus models for us what it means to remain lit in the midst of a world of darkness. And the first thing this text teaches us is that when you remain lit, when the light of your torch is still burning, that you expose hypocrisy. When... When you go back to verse one of this chapter, you will discover that Jesus uttered this statement that he is the light of the world after the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman that they said was caught in the very act of adultery. <laughs> they made her stand before the congregation while they debated scripture and discussed whether she should be stoned to death. The irony in light of their moral pretensions is that they really were not concerned about this woman. They really were not concerned about the veracity of the word of God. According to verse 6, their only interest was religious politics. Somebody say politics, yeah. Uh, so they could bring a charge against Jesus. These men were using this woman and her body as a site to pursue power. I'm working on something. For if they were really concerned about marriage, if they were really concerned about morality, they would have also brought the man who she had to have been sleeping with if she was caught in what? The very act. And noticing this interesting omission in the trial, Jesus calls them on their bluff and Jesus says, okay, you can stone her, but he who has not committed this sin can cast the first stone. <laughs> that is how verse seven ought to be translated. Not he who is without sin. Cast the first stone. No, it should be translated. He who is without this sin. He who has not sinned in this manner can take up the first stone. 
<laughs> and that's when things got quiet, church. And I, I suspect they, stopped, they started dropping their stones one by one because uh, they had been with this sister themselves. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I surmise in my sanctified imagination. Uh, uh, they knew where she was. They knew what time she was going to be in the act. I was wondering, how do you know her address? And how do you know what time she was going to Yeah. They had been with her themselves. These, these pompous, self-righteous, self-appointed morality police really were not concerned about this woman nor were they concerned about her ethical behavior. They were interested in using her body to further their misogyny. They were interested in using her body as a site, as a stage, as a platform to exercise their own power, and that's hypocrisy. They are spiritual forerunners of this fake interest of the rights of the unborn that is coming from the modern day Republicans today. <laughs> they are forerunners of uh, uh, these modern day individuals who proclaim to be interested in the rights of the unborn. Uh, these uh, conservative Republicans and their religious acolytes, the Christian conservatives, who claim to be concerned about the right of the life of the unborn fetus. And yet, <laughs> once the fetus is born, they are again, y'all not here. <laughs> oh, we want to protect the right to life. But then once the baby is born, they are again supporting policies that would enable the baby to have a y'all not here today. Uh, they are hypocrites if, if they were really pro-life. I mean, if they were really pro, they're not pro-life, they're just pro-birth. Because if you were really pro-life, you would support sensible gun reform legislation for weapons that are specifically designed to take that baby's life. If they were really pro-life, y'all not here, they'd have no problem approving funding that would allow families to get baby formula. If they were really pro-life, they would support child tax credits and adequately fund public education. <laughs> y'all ain't fooling nobody. <laughs> Jesus was writing on the ground. He says, y'all ain't fooling nobody <laughs> because the Pharisees then and the Pharisees now are not really interested in people. They just interested in power. And they hide behind these religious cliches and their moral proclamations to mask their wicked and their evil intentions. And so when Jesus says, that he is the light of the world. <laughs> he is saying it against the backdrop of this kind of hypocrisy. <laughs> and he's saying that my light is going to expose the hypocrisy that is going around in the world today. And if we are children of light, we too must expose uh, hypocritical systems and structures uh, that oppress the most vulnerable among us just like this woman. I wish I had some help in here today. As Jesus used his light, we ought to use our lights. We ought to use our gifts and our talents to expose people and practices that hold the most vulnerable and down. Even when we might not be responsible for creating the conditions, we are responsible for how we use our God-given agency to help to make the world a better place. Will you do that? Did you just come to church today? to get something for yourself? Or will you assume responsibility for some tiny corner of the world where there is darkness? And will you make it your business to drive out the darkness in the world? Will you promise to stay lit and to let your light shine before men and women and ensure that your light is never hidden under a bushel? Will you keep your torch burning while you run life's race or will you cower and allow the winds of comfort and convenience to blow your light out? Perhaps that's what Jesus had in mind in Matthew 5, 16 when he said, let your light so shine that men may see your good works. Notice, church, it says that men might see your good works, not you, not your car. Listen, prosperity preachers, not your house, 
not your bank account, not your Gucci and your Louis, not, uh, that they might see your good works and then glorify your father who is in heaven. If there is darkness in the world, as Christians, we are to shed light on it. In the same way that turning our lights causes roaches to run, we must shine the lights on the hypocrisy in our world today. <laughs> hypocrisy. Hypocrisy like that of Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia who has no problem waving the filibuster or raising the debt ceiling or doing deficit spending so long as the beneficiaries are rich and special interests and corporate donors. But all of a sudden, when the spending might benefit people of color or, or when waving the filibuster rules might expand access to the ballot for black and brown people, all of a sudden he hides behind the Senate rules. We must expose the politicians in both political parties who claim there is no money when it comes to health care and schools and the environment and jobs and abolishing student loan debt. But they can sign money for bullets and bombs, for wars and the military, and to bail out banks. We heard so much over the last two years that the deficit and the debt are a problem and we don't have any money, but all of a sudden, when Putin began this unjust war, it seemed like every three days there was another 800 million and then 33, all of a sudden, money just seems to ubiquitously come out of the sky. Y'all not here today. I'm, I see I'm upsetting you. We got to let our light shine, church, on the fact, and we got to stop voting for politicians, Democrats and Republicans, who hide behind cute rhetoric on MLK Day. And yet, they support political rules that keep the poor and black and brown folks oppressed. We, when your light is lit, you expose hypocrisy wherever it is, but, but not only do you expose hypocrisy, you are empowered for daily life and living. When your life is lit, <laughs> the thing about a light church is that light can also har be harnessed as a source of power. Can the church say power? And the way that Jesus treats this woman in this chapter during her time of need is a source of empowerment for her. This woman lived at the mercy of a culture that treated her unfairly. And at a time when she could have been abandoned, left out in, in, to, on the margins of society and left for dead, the text says that Jesus speaks to her. He empowers her and he picks her up. This woman is a victim of trauma, but when she met Jesus, she met a different kind of man. You know, sometimes all you need is just to meet a different kind of person. She met a man who did not put her down. She met a man who lifted her, her up and gave her a new lease on life. And I'm struck by something that Jesus says after confronting her attackers. Jesus turned to the woman and said, where are those who condemned you. The Bible says she looked around. She said, I don't see those guys anymore. Then Jesus says something very significant. He says, neither do I condemn you. And I'm not sure if you realize the profundity and, and the power of that proclamation. Because according to the social mores and the religious rules of this time, this woman could have been lawfully stoned and left for dead, but Jesus showed her compassion and that had to be very empowering. And so as the light of the world, Jesus is saying you do not have to let the darkness around you defeat you. That you don't ever have to allow the darkness of the world to dim what I'm doing on the inside of you. That you you don't have to let people or politicians or unjust practices prevent you from progressing toward your promise. It does not matter who the Pharisees are in your life. Don't you let them. Tell your neighbor, don't you let them. Don't you let them cause you to give up on yourself. You have come too far. 
for you to throw in the towel now. God's light has the capacity to cancel and to nullify and to cast out anything that would paralyze your potential and distract you from your destiny. And I want to talk to someone here today who has pushed and pressed and made your way to the house of God. Someone else who is listening online and you are deciding that today is going to be my day. Today is going to be the day that I have had enough of letting people people put me down I believe that he that is within me is qualitatively greater than he that's within the world see light in the ancient world was not like light today there was no light switch to turn on the light when it got dark instead light was provided by oil somebody say oil Oil was placed in lamps that were lit by fire. I feel like, in other words, the source of the light didn't come from the outside. The source of light came from within. And it was there because of the oil. You do know when you read the Bible that oil is a metaphor for the Holy Ghost. And that fire is a metaphor of the Holy Spirit that God places on the inside of us. And so there will come a time when things will get dark, church. Not just in the world around you, but things will get dark on the inside of you. Uh, you'll start a business and sales will get low. You'll take the bar twice and still not pass. You'll work on a job that was not in your major and you'll feel that it's beneath your potential. You'll get married, have a large wedding and three years later you'll find yourself divorced loved ones will become ill and leave you by yourself it'll get dark on the inside but you got to make sure that you got some fire that you've got oil that's lit on the inside so that regardless of the storms that are around you, you'll be able to have peace in the middle. Is there anybody in church today who can testify I'm empowered? I've got fire on the inside of me and it does not matter what's happening around me. I've got fire on the inside. Let me press on. When you're lit, when you're lit, it exposes hypocrisy. When you're lit, you're empowered for daily life and living. But lastly, when you are lit, it brightens the path that God wants you to walk. See, when a light shines, it illuminates, it brightens dim and dark places, making passage a whole lot easier. Jesus is saying that he does the same thing after confronting his accusers, her accusers about their hypocrisy and after empowering her by saying, I do not condemn you. Jesus points this woman in the right direction so that she knows where to go from this point forward. He says to her, go your way. And from now on, don't allow yourself to be taken advantage of by these jokers again. <laughs> This statement, go and sin no more, could very well be translated from the Greek. Go away from this and aim higher. I want to tell someone listening to me right now that, that when the light of God is present in your life, uh, that you don't have to do the same things that you did because you see things more differently than you did before. She, uh, she doesn't have to internalize and listen to the darkness around her. She does not have to let the men around her use her. She is now able to walk a new walk. Because she now can see what she could not see before. You ever been at a point in your life where you could see people and you could see places and you could say things differently than you did before? Jesus steps into this woman's life right on time and he shows her a new way to walk and a new way to live. And that's the same thing that ought to happen to you and to me when the light of God is shining in our lives. For without him, we would be lost. But but with him we are found without him we are alone but with him we have a friend that sticks closer than a brother with him we do not have to stumble and falter in a world of uncertainty have I got a witness in here today when Jesus is the Lord of your life 
And when you have Jesus on the inside of you, things that you used to do, you don't have to do anymore. And places you used to go, you don't have to go there as often. Why? Because you are still lit and you got a light on the inside of you. It's why God said that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Let me close. But when I think about what it means for us to follow Jesus as the light and to be lights in the world. I'm reminded of this story about a little boy and a little girl who were faced with a dilemma. Their brother had taken a boat out to go fishing and while he was out there, a storm arose. The storm was so bad and he was so far away that he was unable to find his way home. And the little boy and the little girl were concerned about their brother and were wondering what to do. They were too small to light the lamp in the lighthouse by themselves. So what happened was the little boy got down on the floor and said to his sister, stand on me. She said, what? He said, yes, stand on me so that you can hold up the light and our brother can make it home. And as she did, the story goes that her arms got heavy. They started shaking and she looked down at her brother and she said, does it hurt, Willie? And he said, of course it hurts, but just keep holding up the light because our brother needs that light. I'm going to get out of your way, but I stopped by to tell somebody that we've got to stay lit and keep holding up the light because our brothers need that light. Our brothers who are incarcerated need that light. Our sisters dealing with depression need that light. And it might hurt sometimes, but you keep holding up the light. Have I got a witness here? Because God's got something for you on the other side of this darkness. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord some praise today. Here at No Limits, we want to do everything we can to help you get the most out of each message preached on the broadcast. That's why we created a free sermon viewing guide for each message. The viewing guide contains some commentary, the key points from the message, some space for note-taking, and questions to consider throughout the week. You can request your free copy of the sermon guide by going to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. And clicking on the Watch tab in the menu at the top of the page. From there, you can view any message from our archives and download the sermon guide for that message before you watch. Thank you for tuning in today, and I pray the message blessed and encouraged you as you strive to live a life with no limits. Join me as we travel to Egypt and Dubai in the spring of 2023. Together we will explore the Great Pyramids of Giza and learn the hidden history of one of the world's greatest ancient civilizations. We will cruise the ancient Nile like the pharaohs once did and disembark at iconic sites such as the Aswan Islands, the Valley of the Kings, and the famous Egyptian Museum of Antiquities. And after we've explored Egypt, we will head to Dubai and explore this great modern city. This is truly the trip of a lifetime, and I hope that you'll join me on this journey. Go to delmancoats.org for more information and to register. But don't delay, as space is limited on this tour. I want to thank you for watching today, and I'll see you right here next week for a new episode of No Limits. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. 
Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. And look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of No Limits and Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland.